Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our service this morning. As you can see, and as you probably know, we're all in lockdown. Um, so we are doing a recorded service. It's Thursday morning. It's about 11 o'clock. We've just heard the, the news that we're in lockdown. So we've come in to record the English and the Welsh services. It's not what the service that we planned because we're not quite ready for that. We had until Sunday to do that. So we're going to record a service that, uh, that Sarah has prepared and then the Welsh service I will do for this afternoon. There will be a uh, coffee chat after this service on Zoom. Uh, all the usual things apply. It, the, the link will be on Facebook. We'll make sure the link's on Facebook. It's been a while since we've done this, so just so that you remember, uh, it'll be on Facebook. But anybody who wants to join us for a, a, a chat afterwards, please join us on Zoom. So welcome to our worship. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we offer our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. All are welcome at our online service today. No matter where you've come from, no matter how you got here, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us at worship today. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from the Old Testament, from the book of Samuel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And then we'll have our reading from Psalm, which is Psalm 113. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies. For I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord, and there is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him our deeds are weighed. 
The bows of the warriors are broken by those who stumbled with arm strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food. But those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seals them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set his world. He will guard the feet of the faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge to the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it's set, the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like our God? The one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look over the earth, heaven and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sets them with princes with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother. Praise the Lord. The Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done, Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath tie, untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come and follow me if I go. 
A reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. You will notice that the sermon is preached without a mask. That is because I preached it prior to anybody being in the church, so I was alone. I was not endangering anyone. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O my rock and my redeemer. Did you know that the Magnificat, Mary's song, was viewed as dangerous, and in India, under British rule, and in Guatemala and Argentina, it is banned from being recited in liturgy or in public. It is revolutionary. It is rebellion. It is insurrection. Cast down the mighty, send the rich away. This girl who has been painted as merry, meek, and mild, she means business. This was not a demure, submissive, passive girl staring up with a white face, turned with pale hands open in supplication. This was a brown girl, a poor girl, and now a girl who was going to face yet another burden of being unwed and pregnant in a society where she's already a religious minority and in an occupied land. Mary doesn't submit. Mary says she will do God's will. That's not submission. That is taking the torch that you are handed, and she takes it. She looks Gabriel in the eye, which would have had to have been fairly frightening, and says, I got this. This is a sermon about rebellion. And I need to say these things because as the first female minister at the Melbourne Welsh Church, I do have, as they say, a pulpit. But be warned, this pastor is going to get political, and a lot of people don't want politics from the pulpit. But don't worry, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or which party is least complicit in social, financial, and economic parity. Spoiler, they're all complicit. <clears throat> Jesus was inherently political, and the powers that be at the time killed him as a result. He upended everything. The last shall be first. Bonhoeffer talks of Mary in 1933, before he was executed by the Nazis. In a sermon, he said, the song of Mary is the oldest Advent hymn in existence. It is at once the most passionate, the wildest, and one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. This is not the gentle, tender, dreamy Mary who we see in paintings. This song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of our Christmas carols. This is a hard song, an inexorable song about the power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. And I hope that my sermon is that kind of political, speaking to power, not trying to grab it. So why am I writing and preaching a sermon about rebellion? Because there are people who say that women cannot receive a call from God. 
there are people that say that a male minister is better than a female minister. There are people who say that the only gifts we have are in family and child-related things. I've been on the edges of the Lutheran Church in Australia and New Zealand community because I am Lutheran and I'm a woman. And fortunately, I'm a woman who has been welcomed into a community that recognizes that keeping people out is not what Mary's baby was born to do. And yet, I try to be an ally to my Lutheran sisters and aunties and mothers and their men. And let me tell you some of my story, which is not something that I do very often from the pulpit in this kind of way. I didn't want to be a minister, but I am a minister, and in Australia, as a Lutheran, this can be problematic. Not for me, not for the church that has called me here, but for the Australian Lutheran Church, it is a problem. When we moved to Australia, I foolishly assumed that I would serve here too, in a Lutheran church, because, against all the odds, it had worked out everywhere else we had lived. (laughs) Whether or not it was allowed never even entered my mind. I had no idea. Imagine being allowed to work, vote, receive wages, drive, whatever you view as an unquestioned normal. And now imagine it being taken away. Imagine you were suddenly told that no, what you had struggled for, struggled with, fought for, persevered to accomplish, what you had dragged your family through and what they had dragged you through as well to get through at all, them holding you up and pushing you on when you were too tired to do so, and then, after succeeding, being told, oh, no, no, no. That doesn't count. It was for nothing. You can't, because you're a woman. I don't think Mary ever considered the fact that there were people out there absolutely telling her that she can't possibly be the vessel for God. I have always walked a fine line of depression. I've managed it with diet and exercise, regular sleep and routine, and of course my animals and my family. Because it wasn't until recently that we were even allowed to say these kinds of things out loud. We just dealt with it. We never shared that we struggled with mental health. I write, sometimes just to get the words out, and I surround myself with animals who don't judge, who need and give back love more than they receive and filling love to give to others. But for the first time, after arriving here, the shadow was stronger than the light, and I sank deeper into depression. I tried to do what the Archbishop of the Estonian Lutheran Church had asked me to do here and serve the members of the closed congregation here, and I found that I was unbelonging there as well. Not enough Estonian language, frankly, an American, not an Estonian. And it was at a time when being American was a question of character as opposed to pride. It took a year to ask for help. It took another three to stop crying constantly and six months again to believe in my purpose. And that's fast, as those who struggle with depression know. I had a leg up. I knew what I was struggling with, and I was able to articulate it. I had been fearing this for years, and I'd felt like I'd lost some sort of battle. But it was really more like the weather, and I was prepared. I still almost miss my signs, but my family and friends who are on this road already, and frankly, fear, picked me up and pushed me on. But it was a fight, and I needed allies. So what in the world does one woman's depression have to do with the Magnificat? 
Well, like Mary, the Holy Spirit and my faith gave me the means. Both of those put me in a place to fight both the depression and to really understand what the women in the church were going through, both here and elsewhere and in the past. It is not what I expected to be doing, not even a little bit, with my time in Australia. And in true form, it was the Holy Spirit who once again stepped up and diverted me into a little inclusive, ecumenical, international church that wasn't even sure what being Lutheran might mean. They welcomed me with God's hospitality and theirs, and I knew that the flame had just been damped, not put out. They asked me to come share my call and to connect, and it has been amazing. It has been wonderful to grow in faith in ways that I had never expected. Coronavirus shut us down, and we found freedom in the constraint. We learned to laugh on camera and goof off and be each other's strength. I continue to be Lutheran to my core, but we are in love with God here, so we work together for a common goal. I want the Australian Lutheran Church, which is getting ready to vote again on the place of women. And I want them to feel this hospitality and acceptance, all of them, men and women, boys and girls, they're watching, they're learning. And so I support from the edges. I watch and I pray. I love where I am, and I don't want to be a trailblazer for the Australian Lutheran Church. I want the girls and the women who love that denomination of Lutheran to blaze their own trail. I'm their ally in this. I can touch my torch to theirs, but it is the ALC who will figure this out one way or another. And that's one of the lessons that Mary gives us. With faith, we can hold the torch, pass the torch, or put it down. Isabel Allende recently said something that I needed to hear that day. She said, I am not passing any torches. I will light the torches of other women, but I will not give up mine. I cannot be unbelonged from God's family, and neither can you. We are all God's family, and he loves us. If my name is reduced to the persistent Mrs. Bishop, belonging to my husband, or reduced to an add-on, if my name is forgotten and I'm just that automatic American minister who passed through here, that's okay. If I fall so far into the darkness that I forget that I'm even holding a torch, there are people out there to help me keep it lit. And the spirit who will never, ever let it be damped. My faith will continue to light the way, and so will yours. Most importantly, he called me here, and here I stand. And he calls you. Where do you stand? Mary articulates the hope of an oppressed people, and I can't believe I'm saying that in the year 2021 and referring to women. <laughs> but she articulates the hope of oppressed people, not just women, but anyone marginalized, lost, forgotten, ignored, or forbidden to participate. And although it is quiet, it is a demand. And Mary insists that the world be turned upside down. Or maybe it's right side up, depending on who you ask. If you ask Jesus, it's turning the world right side up. In the blink of an eye, Mary sings, 
the counterintuitive nature of God's reign. The wealthy are impoverished. The impoverished are made wealthy. The powerless are powerful, and the powerful become powerless. In the blink of an eye, Mary goes from a docile peasant girl to, in the words of Roger Wolseley, a punk rocker. Imagine this song yelled at the top of your lungs. That's Mary. Here I am, Lord. We've got this. Mary isn't alone. She's surrounded by women who can keep that light lit. She's surrounded by women who support her through her pregnancy. She's surrounded by women who are also pregnant, joyful, fearful, scared, getting ready to bring something miraculous into the world. All of them. She's surrounded by women who will never bear children or surrounded by women who are only there in spirit. Mary isn't alone, and neither are you. Mary is surrounded by men who love her, and while they might not understand what's going on exactly, that's okay, because neither does Mary. And they've all got this. The church is not listening to Jesus when it excludes the rules that we put in place because we call it good order are not Jesus' rules. His rule is all means all. And that's hugely important because when the rules are more exclusive than inclusive, we have to take a good, hard look at why. Why are we gathering? Why are we excluding? What is our purpose? What is our goal? What are we afraid of? What are we trying to keep out? Why? The Magnificat invites them. It pulls us in and it pulls us together. It is a song that is lit one torch at a time until the world is overtaken by the light. The Magnificat is a song of revolution, a song of salvation. Its political and economic and social developments cannot be blunted. People in need in every society, men and women, boys and girls, all of us need to hear this canticle. The battered woman, the single parent, the drug addict, the pedophile, those without food or a table, the homeless, the young who have been abandoned or run away, the old who are discarded or ignored, all of us need the hope that this song proclaims. And Mary is demanding, albeit quietly, she insists, we must participate. We must call out injustices large and small. We must look confused at the sexist or racist joke and say, I don't understand. Why is that funny? Male and female, we must notice the small things that have crept into our society's normal and realize this is setting us apart and not in a good way. We must stop the little things and communicate the love that gave Mary such confidence to say, okay, Gabriel, I got this. We must continue to be firsts so that a time comes that it, it's, that it is just not worth commenting on gender. It's just a minister preaching the word in the pulpit, sharing God's love and demanding, politely, of course, that you do the same. Let us proclaim it. The church is the people, not the building, not the rules. We are the church of inclusion, not exclusion. Together we welcome other, no matter who. We are a place of revolutionary acceptance. And together we welcome the other, no matter who. And we do so in the name of the creator, the created, 
and the creating spirit. Amen. As is our custom, we will have a time of quiet personal prayer. We'll follow that with corporate prayer, and then we'll end saying the Lord's Prayer together. The response at the end of the petition and in your mercy is, is hear our prayer. Come, let us turn to God with our prayers this morning. Let us pray.
We pray for the healing and well-tending of all that you have given us, from water and air, soil and stars, for creatures that roam the seas and those that fly thousands of miles in migration, for mammals and reptiles, insects and microbes in swamps and forests, and even in our own homes. Show us their beauty and our need for them, in sickness and in health. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who sing with Mary a song of joy for deliverance, for all people who long to hear you, your promise of good news, for all peacemakers, for governments that hold at the heart of their work the needs of people otherwise invisible, for all people left homeless and destitute by the greed of others. Lend, sorry, lead your people from darkness to light in righteousness and justice. And in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for everyone who is in any need today, for the lonely and for all who are anxious at this time, for our elders in the nursing homes, for people who cannot find work and those whose work is not life-giving for them, for those whom we now name in the silence of our hearts. In joy and in sorrow and in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that Mary's song of joy and Joseph's loyalty, Hannah's faith and David's song will be magnified in us. Fill us with the breath of the Creator. Light with us the power of the Son. Move us with the wind of the Spirit. Stir us to extend ourselves beyond what we thought possible. Show us that like Mary, we need not fear in longing and in preparation. And in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stir up your power, O God, and come set us free by the righteousness of your birth in our midst, by the light of your face shining upon us, and by becoming our brother, our friend, our salvation. We pray this in the name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, in humility and joy, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty one who scatters the proud and fills the hungry, by your Holy Spirit, let, it, let your word leap in us and bring us to our yearning, that joy that comes with new beginnings and renewed lives. In redemption and renewal, and in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you reveal yourself in so many ways, especially in your Son, Jesus Christ. We gather up the prayers of this community, the world, and all in need, confident that you know our deepest thoughts and will refresh our spirits. We pray in the name of Christ, the one who transforms principalities and powers and renews the heavens and the earth. Christ, our Savior, in empathy and hope and in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for all our sisters and brothers in Christ who gather as we do on this day all over the world in houses, in churches, in storefronts, on reservations, in townships, on base communities, among immigrants, in hospital chapels and prisons, online and in person, with those who are dying and those who are searching. Wherever the church is found on frontiers of mission and service, empower its witness to strengthen and stretch the vision of your people in weakness and in strength. And in your mercy, Hear our prayer as we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our announcements are as follows. As we are in lockdown until at least Thursday night, Friday morning, uh, we do need to have something to do. So Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock, there will be a quiz. 
We'll have another church quiz on Tuesday at four o'clock. Uh, I'll run it. We'll have a one-off special prize of $5 for anybody who wants to come. Uh, and it'll be lovely to see you all at the church quiz on Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. In the usual Zoom room, the same one you're in now. Uh, no, you're not in a Zoom room now, are you? The same, the same one you'll be in for the coffee chat after the service. Uh, it, it'll be the same Zoom room. Uh, we'll put the details up, don't worry. But we'll have a, a Zoom uh, church quiz Tuesday at 4 p.m. If we're allowed to meet next Sunday, which is the 6th of June, there will be a service here at 11 a.m. and Sarah will be taking that service. And there'll also be a service at the Shrine of Remembrance. I'll be at the Shrine of Remembrance with the Normandy veterans for their annual D-Day service, the, 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 the commemoration of the Normandy landings 77 years ago this year. That will be at 11 o'clock. We, we gather about quarter to 11 uh, for an 11 o'clock service at the Shrine of Remembrance. Or you can meet us here at 11 o'clock for a service. Or you can meet us online at 11 o'clock for the service from here. So that's all that will be happening this week. Oh, Bible study Wednesday morning again. will be done on Zoom. Please join us. It'd be lovely to see you. We're racing through the book of, Psalm, uh, book of Proverbs. We're on Proverbs chapter 19. This week, we're beginning Proverbs chapter 19 this week. So if you'd like to join us, please do uh, on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, apart from that, I don't think there are any more announcements at the moment. Um, so we'll sing our third hymn. Oh, one final announcement. Uh, having watched the, um, the, the acting premier's speech this morning, one of the things he does encourage us all to do is to get our vaccines. So if you haven't been vaccinated, please, please, please consider going this week and having your vaccine. It is the fifth reason why you can leave your house this week. So you can go out and do some shopping, go and do your two hours of exercise, and then you can go and get your vaccine done as well. So uh, I would encourage you strongly to try and get the vaccine this week. That is all our announcements for this morning. We'll now sing our final hymn.
May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and bring you peace. Amen. Grace and heart of Jesus Christ, the Cariatim. A fantastic and a spuklana, but the Giddy for you all for our home, it is. Amen. Test one, two, testies. Oh. Yes, hello. Okay. Yeah, hello. Good morning. Sarah's works. My like is live. Are we recording? Yes. Can I take my mask off? I should do it in the mask today. You were preaching without a mask. All right. We're going to sing our first hymn. I don't know what it is yet because we haven't managed to choose it because we haven't got an organist here. It'll be a recorded hymn. Take that bit out because that's a bit silly. Please have a seat for our sermon. They're sitting already. What am I talking about? You still recording? The Gospel from the 13th chapter of Luke. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. <laughs> she had a son. <laughs> I'll fix that one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> I think he did, Lord bless you and keep you, didn't he? I'll do them both and we'll figure it out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe. Amen. 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 Uh, Anything else? 